there's a word tonight. How many are ready for the word at the outside church? How many believe in revival? How many know and can say, God, speak to me tonight? Come on, I need everybody sitting down to stand to their feet in honor of the word of God and say, God, speak to me. Speak to me the way you want to speak to me. I open up my heart to receive your word that gives me life, direction, and purpose. This is not a, an opinion of man. This is thus says the word of God. And we pray that God put a, 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 a fire in his lips, in his mouth, in his tongue. That he can preach word that will set you free. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Come on, Pastor Ben. How many feel the presence of the Lord right now? How many feel the spirit working and doing some things? Praise God, praise God, praise God that the spirit is in this place. I needed that, amen. Did you need that as well? It's almost like the revival happened before the word was given, but it lines up almost directly with the word that I'm, I'm bringing here. And so I'm excited you may be seated. Uh, this word is a little unorthodox for me, but I need you to rock with me. I need you to talk back to me. Amen? Amen. Anybody that can talk back in here? Come on, this ain't a quiet church. Is there anybody that can talk back in this place to the preacher? I need some help tonight. Amen? Yeah. Praise God. And so uh, I tried to run from this word multiple times. I couldn't. I had this, this scripture for over a month. I tried to find different things to preach, <laughs> reasons why I shouldn't preach this, but God just wouldn't let me, and my spirit was touched, and I believe this word is in season. So rock with me, okay? Uh, if you could turn in your Bibles to Revelation 3, 14 to 22. Revelation 3, 14 to 22. I'm going to go ahead and read it. Revelation 3, 14 to 22. It says, write this letter to the angel of the church in Laodicea. This is the message from the one who is the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's new creation. Now, this is Jesus talking. He says, I know all the things you do, that you were neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but since you are like lukewarm water, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And so I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you'll be rich. Also buy white garments from me so you will not be ashamed of your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. I correct and discipline everyone I love. So be diligent and turn from your indifference. Look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. Those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne just as I was victorious and sat with my father on his throne. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. That is the word of God. Amen. amen. Yeah, so this is an unorthodox message for me. I got one point. Y'all ready? Your status in the spirit matters more than your status in the world. I'm going to say it again. Your status in the spirit, your spiritual condition matters much more to Jesus. It's much more pivotal for you than your status in this world. Our spiritual condition is a really big deal to Jesus. And so in Revelation, this portion of it, Jesus is addressing seven different churches in a series of letters. He's praising some and he's correcting others, telling each of them what, what needs to be done before their churches could be considered victorious churches. And these letters are timeless, they're generational, and they're relevant even to the, to the body of Christ today. 
In our text, we're looking at the church of Laodicea, a wealthy city of trade, a wealthy city of communication and, and education. And many people would pass through Laodicea daily because there was a, a, a popular Roman trade route that went right through the middle of the city. And that trade route connected to other uh, big cities. And so a lot of people came through Laodicea. It was popping. It was a hub for banking and buying and selling and trading and bartering of goods. It was a communication hub of manufacturing and, and distribution of fine linens. And there were temples to all different types of gods in that city. So there was a lot of reasons for people to pass through. They were famous for uh, an, an eye ointment that they had created, and they were also um, known for their education and, and medicinal products that they created. And, and this was an economically wealthy and thriving city. They didn't experience lack. From the outside looking in, it looked like they had it all together. And in this letter, Jesus didn't call out, it's crazy because he didn't call out any bickering. There was nothing that was out of order in terms of uh, quarreling. It, there was no infighting. He didn't call out any false teachers. There was no moral failures. There was no wolves in sheep's clothing. Nobody was dipping into the ties in the offering bucket, amen? There was no scandals. So you would think from the outside looking in that this was a thriving church. But Jesus, the faithful and true witness who can see right through man, come on somebody, the one that searches the hearts of mankind and takes spiritual inventory of these seven churches, he has something to tell them. He has something to tell them. Yeah. So imagine Laodicea, right? You know, because they got it all together. They they probably waiting for their waiting for their letter, eagerly anticipating that Jesus is going to bless them and say something great about them and commend them because they got it all together. They got you know, they, they, they church is packed. They got a big old state of the art church. You know what I'm saying? Their building funds is popping. Yeah. Ties and offerings is on point. Everybody always in their Sunday best. They buttoned up to the T. They got all their ducks in a row, and they say. They have everything they need, and they don't need a thing. Yeah. But to their horror, they received the most severe reproach of any of the seven churches. Jesus calls them out because of the status of their souls, which mattered much more to him than the status of their reputation. Can I get a witness in this place? He calls them lukewarm. Call me anything but that. He calls them lukewarm. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. You're disgusting to me. You make me want to vomit. You, you sicken me. You're detestable. How did they get there? Can you imagine how they felt expecting to receive a, a blessing and then they receive something total, the total opposite? Res expecting to, to hear that they got it all together, then they like, they get a message that's totally contrary. Like, no, nah, y'all got to get it together. How do they get to this position? How do, how do we get in this position? What causes lukewarmness? Tonight we're going to look at the root and the cure of this dangerous state that sickens our Lord and Savior. The first thing he points out to Laodicea, the first thing is their indifference. And that's basically their passion was off point. Their passion, they were lacking zeal and passion for Jesus. They weren't running to Jesus. They was going to church. Yeah, maybe they was going to church for other reasons. Maybe they was, was, was in church, but they weren't having church. See, when you're in church and you ain't having church, that means you're coming for, for other things, right? Like ulterior motives, like you coming so that you can get a position and get some sort of status, right? So your reputation can, can be popping so that you can be kind of worldly, if, if, if you will, so, so, so that... Your status can, can go up. You know, you can post on social media and get them likes, right? You know? Or maybe you come in because, you know, you, you wanna you wanna you wanna get some brownie points with your significant other, so you come to church. You come to church so that you can get them them brownie points with that significant other, so that later on you can get that good loving. Uh never mind, let me stop. Indifference and, and lack of passion for Jesus. I am rich. I have everything I need. I don't need a thing is what Laodicea says. Jesus points to their one weakness that they have, and everyone in the surrounding regions would know about it very well. 
a weakness that Laodicea had no control over. And Jesus was using metaphors to speak to them in this unique way. He speaks to us using metaphors in a broad way, in a unique way, a personal way, but that everyone would, would understand. And see, Laodicea was right next to Oropolis. Oropolis was, was, was to the north of Laodicea, and it was known for its hot springs, its hot water. It was known for, for medicinal value. It had medicinal benefits, and many in that region and, and regions around would come to, to Oropolis and, and be benefited uh, therapeutically by those hot springs. And to the east of Laodicea was Colossae, known for its cold water, its cold springs. They had uh, uh, as a matter of fact, cold water is useful. Uh, for instance, if you take a plunge in it for a few minutes, it'll, cr it'll create sickness-fighting white blood cells in your body. Cold water is useful. It's useful for drinking. It has digestive benefits, and it naturally detoxifies and rehydrates the body quicker. So they have useful water in Arapolis. They have useful water in Colossa. It's funny because Laodicea says they don't need a thing, but the, the very water that they're drinking See, their, their water was provided from the south through an aqueduct that was full of calcium and lime deposits. It was dirty, and by the time it reached them, it was lukewarm. It was nasty. It was disgusting. And so Jesus gets right to the heart of the matter with a metaphor that everyone would know. He says, I know all the things you do. You're not hot. You're not cold. I wish that you were one or the other, but you lukewarm out here. You can't fool me. So I'm going to go ahead and spit you out of my mouth. Isn't it funny? They say they have everything they want and they don't need a thing, but all their money couldn't fix their water problem. Okay, now let me get spiritual. They say they have everything they need, they have everything they want, and they don't need a thing, but all their wealth, all their money couldn't fix their living water problem. Oh, yeah, they had some problems. They thought they had it all together, but they had two problems. They had a water problem and a living water issue. Listen, I know right now the price of a 24-pack of water is through the roof. Can I get a witness in the building? Yeah, yeah, but there's a type of water. There's a type of water that all the money in the world, listen to me, there's a type of water that's more expensive than Evian. Yeah, it's gonna cost you a little bit more than Perrier. There's a type of water that all the money in the world won't buy you, you gotta go and get it. Listen, if that stream isn't coming in, you better find a way to go and get this living water. I don't know about you, but I'ma go get it. Is anybody in this place say, I'ma go get it? Any go-getters in this place? Go ahead and get that living water that purifies the soul, is refreshing. Okay, I feel like preaching now. <laughs> Jesus says he spits out the lukewarm. He says, y'all nasty. See, at least if you were cold, you could refresh and revive somebody with a word of life. At least if you were hot, you could, be, you could bring a therapeutic word of truth to somebody and reignite their passion for the Lord. But when you're indifferent and complacent, you couldn't care less. You couldn't care less about the condition of the person next to you, spiritually speaking. When you're indifferent and complacent, you, 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 you lack passion. You're apathetic about the things of the Lord. You lack zeal and hunger for God. It's detestable to our God because your, 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 your status in the spirit is what he's concerned about. Your status in the spirit matters more than your status in this world, and, and at least if you were hot or cold, you'd be useful. You'd be useful to serve, you'd be useful to worship. But when you're indifferent and complacent, you're disinterested in anything that has to do with the Lord. You're just going through the motions and your heart isn't in it. Complacency and worship disgust the Lord. It makes them want to vomit. Matthew 15, 8 says, the people worship me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. I wonder if you've lost your passion. I wonder if you lost your zeal for the things of God. I wonder if you've lost your excitement for, for him. He says, so be diligent and turn from your indifference. He's warning them about their complacency towards him. He's warning him. Praise God, we serve a loving God who will warn us about some things. The apathetic lukewarmness and blah attitudes towards the things of God gave them a severe reproach. Jesus didn't even mention one great good thing about them as he did with all of the other churches. 
that he wrote letters to. He's, he's like, yo, come on, man. Y'all, y'all saying y'all rich, y'all have it all together? You don't need a thing? Really? Their self-evaluation was the complete opposite of Jesus's. I wonder if he was to send you a letter and evaluate your spiritual state, would it be different than what you got in your mind? Would it be different than what you're doing? Would it look a little bit... I'm ch- <laughs> Come on, <laughs> he's checking some people tonight. He says, you don't even realize that you're poor, blind, naked, miserable, wretched. The word wretched, actually, it means, it means miserable, pitiable. It also means worthless. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth because you're worthless to me. How can Laodicea be so rich but worthless? Wealthy but worthless to the one who was worthy of it all. Many times we can deceive ourselves and think we're one of the other seven churches. We ain't Laodicea out here. Church is packed. We like the church of Philadelphia because they ain't get no rebukes. They ain't get no warnings. All they got was praise and commendation. Laodicea was a modern-day church. It would be called the apathistic church of Jesus Christ. Apathy. The ACOJC, the apathistic church of Jesus Christ. Just another, add another denomination to the thing. See, that's the church that allows you to believe in God but act like an atheist. Apathyism is when Jesus is Lord, but you just don't act like he is. I wonder how many people will have dual memberships in TLC and the apathistic church of Jesus Christ. Oh my gosh. It's the epitome of worthlessness and indifference. And the apathistic church, it doesn't make people disciples, it makes people despicable, lethargic, lazy, useless, worthless. Exactly what Jesus means when he says lukewarm. Why does, it, why does it bother him so much? Why is he so mad about that? Because we are the bride of Christ. The Bible calls the body of Christ the bride of Christ. We are his bride. He is the groom. He is the groom who's awaiting, he's, he's coming back for his church. The Bible depicts a wedding, a, 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 a wedding scene and wedding ceremony where the bride comes back and sweeps us off our feet. I don't know about you, but is anybody waiting for the groom to come back? Is anybody expecting the groom to come back? I'm waiting for the groom to crack the sky on the white horse with all authority and power in his hand. You know what I'm saying? I'm waiting for the whole world to knee and, and take that knee and, and declare that he is Lord to the glory of God. I want to see the groom come back. So he can sweep us off of our feet in front of all those non-believers. I don't know if you hear what I'm trying to say. The groom is coming back, but I wonder when he comes back to sweep us off of our feet. When the groom comes back, will, 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 will he see a bride that's so apathetic that she didn't even take the time to groom herself? I believe this is the one wedding where it's safe to say that the groom deserves more attention than the bride. Spiritual apathy, indifference, complacency, lack of zeal. What a warning from the Lord. Because this is dangerous territory to be in. If the enemy can take your zeal for Christ, if he can stop you from running to the feet of Jesus, if he can stop you from seeking him, then temptation becomes more enticing. Sin becomes more inviting. The flesh gets louder and falling is almost inevitable. Proverbs 132 says the complacency of fools will destroy them. Christ commands us to turn from our indifference because your status in the spirit is a big deal to him. We become lukewarm by our show of indifference towards Jesus. We also become lukewarm by independence. Jesus confronts Laodicea about their self-sufficiency and independence in their evaluation of themselves. I am rich. I have everything I need. I don't need a thing. 
Laodicea was a hotbed destination for trading and banking and dis distributing and, and selling and of locally uh, made and locally created fine black linens. They were dressing black lin linens as a symbol of their wealth. Right, so people would flock there if they was wealthy and go get them black linens. It's kind of like we do with Yeezys, right? They go drop a G on, uh, it's a status thing. People flocked there. They had it, they had it going on. It was economically popping. They were a self-sufficient, thriving hotspot. People would go there for that, that eye-curing ointment that they, that they created there and distributed there. It was, it was, it was like modern-day New York. They had everything you could think of. It didn't look like they were lacking anything, but spiritually they were lost and bankrupt. As hot as it was, as popping as it was on the map, physically you could see it. You could see it being, you know, that, that, it, was, that it, was, it was thriving. But spiritually it was as if they weren't even there. It was as if that region was barren. The land was bleak. There was nothing there in the spirit. They were off the grid in the spirit. There's a show I enjoy watching. It's called, it's called Off the Grid. It's fascinating to me because I would never do none of this stuff. So I watch other people do it. And I get a kick out of it. And so basically what it is is a show about uh, where people get fed up with society and they don't want to be around people. They just, they, they had it with, with people. They don't want to be bothered, right? So what they do is they travel to remote areas away from civilization, out in the boonies in the woods with the bears and the, and the deer. See, I told you I would never do that. I know <laughs> Brother Justin would. I'm not built like that, so I stay home. And so, but, but what happens is these people go out to the boonies and they build, so, they build uh, um, houses and bunkers, right? They build hideouts and safe havens equipped with compost. Um, they're equipped with, with uh, solar panels and they, they build these gardens. They stock up on biodegradable products and they hunt and they live off the land in isolation, right? So they independent. They self-sufficient, totally off the grid. It's as if they don't even exist. And see, when we as believers feel that we have everything we need and we don't need a thing, we become so off the grid spiritually that we don't even realize that our tent, our fort, our safe havens are set up outside the camp of Jesus Christ. You say, well, I'm not self-sufficient. Well, let me ask you. If God wasn't in your life, would you look any different? For real, like if Jesus wasn't Lord of your life, <laughs> would your life look relatively the same? I wonder. I wonder if you're independent. We get so lost, we get so off the grid, we don't even recognize whose understanding we're leaning on. And Jesus has to remind us of our spiritual conditions. Because they're more important. They're of more importance than the matters of this world. We become so self-sufficient. Our own needs and wants are all we care about. When really, this whole thing is not about us. This is not about us. This right here is not about us. It's always about him. It's about his kingdom agenda. It's about us being ambassadors and pushing forth his agenda on this earth. Self-sufficiency is so dangerous. I don't know about you, but I need Jesus. I need him. Because I don't have everything I want. It's not about me. I don't have everything I want. It's not about me, though. I want to see the lame walk. I want to see my family members delivered from drug addiction, alcoholism. I want to see my family members saved. It's not about me. It's all about him. I want to see the sick healed. Is anybody in agreement with me today? May we never look like Laodicea. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I don't have everything that I need. I don't. I need to see prodigals come back home. I need to see family members saved and delivered and their minds set free. I need to see dry bones live. Come on, somebody. I need to see the glory of God. I need to see the might and the power of God. I want to see children prophesy. I don't have everything I want. I still want more of God because it's always about him. May we never look like Laodicea. 
May we never get this wrong. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. I, I, I. Well, let me ask you, what happens when we remove ourselves from the equation? And what I mean is, if you were never a Christian, would the kingdom of God be affected? Would heaven have less citizens if you weren't a believer? Would the angels even notice? If you were never a Christian, would the world be changed? If you were never a Christian, who else's life would be affected? If you were never a Christian, would it even make any difference at all? We live to glorify God. It's always about him. And this is why we must understand your status in the spirit is much more important than your status in this world. Who cares? 1st Jesus confronts Laodicea about their indifference and their independence and finally he he points out their ignorance he didn't say the word but I'm gonna show you how he points out their ignorance these three things indifference independence and ignorance will lead you to a lukewarm state he says you don't even realize you don't even realize that you're wretched miserable poor blind and naked you don't even realize Because your worldly riches have blinded you. People talking to you, boosting your head up. You don't even realize that you're naked out here with your Jordans on. There's a few Barna research surveys that depict Christian ignorance very clearly. One survey of 1,210 people had only 9% of the respondents that knew what the Great Commission was. 9%? And only 25% of them could accurately define the Great Commission. Ignorance. On another survey, only half the Christians knew who preached the Sermon on the Mount. The enemy uses our ignorance against us. He uses our own ignorance against us. He weaponizes it. He d Listen, he don't even have to form it. The weapon is already created by us and we just hand it to him. The, the Bible says in Isaiah that, that therefore my people are going into captivity because they have no knowledge. In verse 21 of our text, Jesus says, those who are victorious will sit with me on my throne. That means those who obey and, and, and obtain victory over the world, the flesh, and the devil. And, and the Bible calls Satan the, the prince of darkness. We're taken captive by our lack of knowledge. And the prince of darkness wants, to, wants us to stay in darkness and ignorance is the way this happens. He knows the Bible says that people will perish for lack of understanding. If we don't realize that we are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, then we give way to the enemy's attacks. See, see, Satan doesn't just see you physically. He sees you in the spirit. How you looking spiritually today, church? Satan knows your true spiritual condition. He knows if you are wretched, poor, blind, worthless, exposed, and naked without the armor of God, vulnerable, so he can move in and steal, kill, and destroy. And when he does, we prematurely blame it on him when it was really our spiritual ignorance that caused all hell to break loose in the first place. All hell breaking loose in your home. All hell breaking loose at your job. All hell breaking loose everywhere you go. Why? Because you're ignorant. If only we knew the God that we serve and how much he wants us to love and have an intimate relationship with him. If only we knew how much he cares about us and wants us to be just as excited for him. Matter of fact, more excited for him than we are for anything else in this world. He wants us to be in the dark about our own spiritual condition. That's the enemy. 
He wants us to stay in that state of ignorance. He wants the, the church to be in, in the dark about their own spiritual condition. That's why you don't hear a lot of words like this. He wants, the enemy wants to have his way with us and he keeps us in darkness in order to do so. He wants us to be ignorant like Laodicea who doesn't even realize that they are wretched. They don't even realize they are miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They don't even realize they are lukewarm. They didn't even realize that Jesus wasn't in the church with them. He was standing outside waiting for somebody to hear his knocks and open the door to let him in. Will you open the door tonight? They were ignorant about their spiritual pride. When they say, I am rich, and there's a good possibility they, they also meant rich spiritually. And so they believed, like a lot of us believe, that all of their blessings came from their spirituality. We see this today in modern preaching where people are being told that their monetary blessings and success are a d direct result of their spirituality. And we can, we can be so ignorant to believe that and allow spiritual pride to seep in. Ain't got nothing to do with that. And we feel entitled to what we call blessings. God, you should bless me. I'm entitled to something. When the blessing is being holy. The blessing is being holy. We get to go to heaven. We get to be sons and daughters of the most high God. We get to walk this world covered by the blood of Jesus. We get to do this. That's the blessing. That's the blessing. Because reality is, <laughs> there are people living totally ratchet lives. Robbing, stealing, wilding out, gloating about the money they got. And they, and, they, and they might be successful in the, in, the, in the eyes of the world, more successful than you and me. Is it because they're spiritual? Absolutely not. Reality is, there are people that are way more spiritual, way more prayed up, way more holy, way more sanctified, way more humble than us who are persecuted and ran over with steamrollers in North Korea. Why? Because they declare themselves as Christians and don't care what it costs them. I'm preaching to somebody today. I feel this thing right now. There's some hearts being pricked. I know it. I ain't come here to play no games today. This word been stirring in my spirit. It's a seasonal word. There's a reason that we had a glorious, but one of the most memorable, if not the most memorable service we ever had, a 10-year anniversary. And then the very next prayer service was more empty than it's ever been in 10 years. There's something going on in the spirit. I'm going to call it out tonight, and I'm going to tell you like, like it is. There's something going on in the spirit. Jesus wants you to love on him, to seek him, to run to him, to search for him like never before. And so I won't hold my words back tonight. Jim Rohn said it best. He said, the worst kind of arrogance is arrogance from ignorance. Church, your spiritual condition is a big deal to our God. Your status in the spirit matters more than your status in this world. Laodicea is the church of indifference, the church of independence and ignorance. This is the condition that many of the churches in America and across the globe are in today. This may also be the condition that you see yourself in as well. But if you're ever going to be transparent, this is the place to do that. I'm not knocking you down. I'm picking you up with the truth of the word of God. God is so good that it gives us the answers to this, this sickness, this lukewarmness in the same exact text that we read tonight. The Bible says he's, he corrects and disciplines everyone he loves and he lays out the answers for us. One thing Jesus says we must do is hear his voice. Somebody say hear his voice. Touch your ear and say hear his voice. Yeah, we got to hear his voice. If we seek him and we listen for his voice, we hear what he is saying. Then he won't have to tell us what he told Laodicea. We we'll already know what's up. We'll make the correct adjustments. He told them that they didn't realize they were spiritually poor, blind, and naked. He points out their ignorant state. And in verse 22, he says, anyone with ears to hear must listen to the spirit. If we listen to the Spirit and, and do what Jesus is saying, we'll know our spiritual condi condition. 
And if you want a word from God, go ahead and open up the word of God and you'll hear him clearly. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he says, examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Examine yourselves. He says, test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. If not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. Well, Laodicea didn't know that Jesus Christ was not among them. But listen, if we're, if we're listening to his spirit and examining our faith and testing ourselves as instructed by his word, we can prevent lukewarmness. Is anybody testing themselves to see if they're real about this? Testing your faith? Proverbs says, be sure to know the condition of your flocks and give careful attention to your herds. And so basically that's a, that, that means to be knowledgeable and take inventory of your finances, to be wise financially. But, but check this out. Since your status in the spirit matters more than material wealth to our God, this ancient proverb can also be applied spiritually as we know just how important it is to take spiritual inventory of yourself. Take inventory of your heart. Compare it and contrast it to the word of God so you can see where you're at. Are you listening to his voice? Verse 20 says, if you hear my voice, oftentimes we think about the knock and the opening of the door, right? But he says, if you hear my voice and open the door, because it's not just open the door. You got to do what he's telling you to do. If you hear his voice, you'll be able to know that he's not even in the church in the first place. You, you would know that. You'd be able to discern where he's at. Listen, the beast of Revelation is defeated by faith in Jesus alone. And Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When we hear the word of God, we won't be ignorant to our, spirit, to our spiritual conditions. We won't be ignorant to the schemes of the enemy. Hearing is the key to, to victory. Those who are victorious will sit with Jesus on his throne. That's what he tells us. Does anybody want to sit with Jesus on his throne? If you don't want to sit with Jesus, what are you here for? Why are you sitting here? I want to sit with him on his throne. I want to sit with the one who is victorious. Not only do we have to hear his voice, the next thing we have to do is buy what he is selling. We got to buy what he is selling. In order to buy what he is selling, he commands us to be diligent and turn from our indifference. He, he commands us to repent. We have to have zeal. Basically, the total opposite of indifference. But how can we buy anything if we're in this spiritually bankrupt condition? First, by grace. But, you know, we have to repent, obviously, in order to have an excitement or even want to purchase what Jesus is selling. We got to repent of what was making us broke in the first place. Amen. Then we'll want it. Then we'll go and get it. Then we'll go and get that gold that's, that's purified by fire with no impurities. Then we'll be able to stand the test of faith so that when our faith is tested, we can persevere. To purchase this gold is to give Jesus our hearts. Matthew 6, 21 says, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. We have to surrender to Jesus. Give him our hearts. Let Christ become our treasure, our portion, and store up treasures in heaven. When we buy what he is selling, we purchase that white garment, that white garment of righteousness to cover our shame. Isn't he good? He covers us with his garments. He covers us with a garment of praise. He covers us from the attacks of the enemy. But we got to purchase it. We got to go and get it. And then when we buy that ointment, for our eyes. It's only then that we'll be able to see the glorious majesty, the splendor of our Lord Jesus. It's only then that we'll recognize just how foolish we've been. It's only then that we'll understand how foolish we are for making Jesus the object of our indifference, the object of our complacency, the object of our blah condition. Because Jesus is worthy. Jesus is worthy. I lift up his name because he is worthy. I extol the name of Jesus because he is worthy. I lift up his, I magnify the great and holy name of Jesus Christ. 
He is to be honored. He is worthy to be praised, worthy to be honored, worthy to be lifted up. Come on, somebody. He is worthy of all the adoration that I can give him. He is worthy of my praise. He is worthy to be breast. He is worthy to lead me. He is worthy to lead this church. Jesus is worthy. And I don't care what it takes, but I'm going to always lift up my voice. I don't know if you can do that with me tonight. But I'm going to lift up my voice like a trumpet in Zion, boldly declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He is worthy of all our praise. He is worthy of the honor. He is worthy of me getting up off my butt and praising his name, lifting my hands, blessing him because he is worthy. Go ahead and shout hallelujah to your God tonight. He is worthy. He is worthy. So we got to hear his voice. We got to buy what he is selling. And lastly, I'm closing. We got to open the door. Somebody say, open the door. Open the door for Jesus. Open the door for Jesus. That's the answer to our independence and self-sufficiency. We got to open the door. That's the answer to our independence. Reminds me of a story when I was a little, when I was like six or seven, my brother and I went to the boardwalk with my mom and dad in Atlantic City. And if you've never been to a boardwalk, it's amazing. It's, it's so much fun. Um, it's like carnival slash fair slash outlets. There's great places to shop and eat and arcades and the food's amazing. And it's right there on the beach. It goes on for miles and miles and miles. And my brother, you know, we was wild. He was a little older than me. He's like, He's like, yo, Lynn, let's just run. And, and I'm like, okay. The board walks packed. He's like, let's just run. Let's just run away from mom and dad. Let's run as far as we can for as long as we can, as fast as we can. Let's just do it. And I'm looking at him like, that sounds amazing. <laughs> so we're running as fast as we can and about 100 yards away, our parents finally realized that we're gone and there's a lot of people and we're short, small, and we're shifty, so we're in and out of the people and they just can't catch us. And they tell this story all the time because they got so scared, they were screaming to, to try to get people's attention to stop us from running. We ran for like a long time. And they was old too, they was sweating, they was hot. Man, they couldn't catch us. It was so exhilarating and we was just gone. Finally, they caught us. But you know, that story hits a little different as an adult. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking like a parent now, like, where was we going? <laughs> Who's going to feed us? We ain't had no money. Where was we going to stay at? We ain't had no money to get on the rides. What's the whole purpose we was there? Like, how are we going to go in the arcade? We was just running. We was free. We was independent. We was like, yeah, we out. My parents were hot. We got it when we got home, boy, let me tell you. But where was we going to go? Who, who, who would have cared for us? What would have happened when them storms hit? See, independence can be fun for a while. It can be exhilarating for a moment. It can even be empowering for a time until we realize he's not with us. Who's going to protect us? Who's going to provide open doors, make ways and move mountains? Who's going to lead us? I don't know about you, but I need him. I need Jesus. I need the Lord Jesus Christ in my life every minute, every hour. I need him. John 15, 5 says, apart from me, you can do nothing. John 6 says, Jesus was preaching to, to, to the very words of spirit and life to his disciples, and many of them left him. And then he turns to the 12 and he says, are y'all going to lead me too? Listen to what Peter says. Peter replied, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words that give eternal life. We believe and know you are the Holy One of God. See, Christianity is unique in that we get to worship a relational God. He can relate to us, and he doesn't force his way in the door. He doesn't force the relationship on us. He's a good, good guy. Jesus wants us to open the door. 
He wants us to let him in. He wants us to allow him to be our portion. He wants us to allow him to be the source of our joy. He wants us to allow him to be our peace. He wants to lift us up when we are weak and we feel we can go no further. He wants to give us strength when we are down. He wants to renew our minds when we wild and out. He wants to be our everything. He is the beginning and the end. He is the, he's there at the start of my issues and he also wants to be the one who finishes them. He is worthy of praise. Worthy for us to allow him to lead us. Worthy of our worship. And he longs to have intimate moments with us. He wants to sup with us. He wants to have communion with us. He wants us to commune with him and have, have a meal with him. We, while we ponder the bread of life and we think about the living water. And to, it, it, while, we, while, we, while we do this. We, we find different reasons and different ways throughout our days to, to just trim him out of our lives. We find ways to do that. And when we do that, whether we know it or not, we're declaring independence. And I can't imagine one of my kids pushing me away. Can you imagine that? Now multiply that by millions upon millions. We get a real good glimpse of why he's so upset about lukewarmness. I need Jesus, church. Is anybody in this place that needs Jesus? I need Jesus. I need Jesus right now. I need Jesus to take my burdens. Without Jesus, I am nothing. Without Jesus, I'm a scumbag. You don't want to see me without Jesus. Without Jesus, I am nothing. I need him to take my burdens. The only way I can know the truth is with Jesus Christ. I need Jesus to be the one who fills my cup. I need Jesus to accurately love my wife. I need Jesus to lead my family. I need him. I need Jesus to preach this very message. Does anybody in this place need Jesus? I need Jesus to keep me sane. I need Jesus to give me strength. Without Jesus, I'd be in shackles. I'd be in bondage. I'd be in chains without Jesus. I'd have no hope. I'd be foolish without Jesus. I would be lost without him. I would give into my flesh without Jesus. Without Jesus, I wouldn't have the power to resist the devil. Without Jesus, I would give in to sexual temptations, urges, and desires. Without Jesus, I am nothing. Without Jesus, my marriage would be fractured. My house would be broken. Without him, I'd be wretched. Without him, I'd be poor, blind, naked, and miserable. I would be nothing without the Lord Jesus Christ in my life. This is why we can't be independent. I need him. I need Jesus. Without Jesus, I would fall into the snares and the traps of the enemy. Without Jesus, I would be. Without him, I'd be strung out on pills. Without him, I'd be worse. I'd be dead like my auntie from a drug overdose. Without him, I'd be dead like my uncle from another drug overdose. Without him, I would be dead like my nephew from drug-related illness. Can I be real tonight? Without Jesus Christ, I'd be in and out of halfway houses like my uncle. Without Jesus, I would be in and out of jail from drug-related charges like my brother who's passed away. Without Jesus, I would be in and out of halfway houses most of my adult life like my other auntie. Without Jesus Christ, my adult life would be defined by addiction, just like my dad. Without Jesus Christ, my whole adult life would be defined by substance abuse, like my birth mother. I'm nothing without them. I'd be in bondage and shackles without it. You think I'm playing? I would be nothing without Jesus. Without Jesus Christ, I would push my own children away like my mother did to me so that I can declare my own independence. <laughs> But it's okay, don't come to prayer service on Tuesday. I'm not playing no games with the Lord. I don't do this for me. It's not about us. It's always about him. When I think about if we would have never moved to Florida, where I would be. But Jesus had a plan to, to snatch me out of the hands of the enemy. He's a good salesman. He redeems us from the plans of Satan. He bought us for the price. The blood of Jesus protects me. The blood of Jesus covers me. The blood of Jesus gives me the confidence to go in any territory and proclaim the truth that Jesus Christ can set you free. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. There is no one like my God. And so if you find yourself in a lukewarm state tonight, I just want to open up the altar. 
we are praying church we would love to pray for you we would love to speak life over